As I'm sure you're aware, many of the motifs found in the Gospels and Acts can be traced to older mythological ideas found in the Old Testament and pre-first century myths from around the ancient world. And for many of these, their ultimate origin was the astrological observations. There's a large literature on this, but its main import is on triumphal historicity rather than the distinction between minimal historicity and mythicism, and it's for that reason that I have not covered the subject so far. There is one aspect of this, however, that is relevant to the mythicist versus minimal historicities debate, and that concerns the 70-year argument. This argument is expanded by Michael Lawrence in his video Just Suppose, where he also advances the Christians before Christ argument. The 70-year argument proposes that the central date in the founding of Christianity was not the death and resurrection of Jesus, but rather the destruction of the Second Temple of Jerusalem in 70 AD by Titus in the second year of Vespasian's reign. Prior to that date, there had been a number of Jewish sects, including some who worshipped a purely spiritual Jesus. The main sect, however, remained the temple cult, with its requirement for annual sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins. The war and destruction of Jerusalem heralded a period of persecution of Jews and a major religious upheaval. Yahweh had clearly forsaken his people and allowed for their means of forgiveness and redemption to be curtailed. Historicist Christianity was a response to this disaster. It proposed that the destruction had been brought on by the Jews' rejection of their Messiah, and that temple sacrifice was no longer necessary following a final all-time sacrifice of Jesus. And, as followers could avoid being identified as Jewish, it also had the potential to assist them in avoiding persecution. To see how this could have arisen, we need to look at the book of Daniel. It was supposedly written by a Jewish prophet, Daniel, who was in Babylon with the Jewish community in exile between 598 and 538 BC. Note that Solomon's temple was destroyed in 586 BC, so there were obvious parallels between Daniel's situation and the founders of historicist Christianity. The book of Daniel is in two parts. In chapters 1 to 6, there are a series of stories about the Babylonian royal court, such as Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the fiery furnace, Belshazzar's feast, and Daniel in the lion's den. Chapters 7 to 12 are about a series of visions and apocalyptic prophecies. This second part is now thought to date from around 200 BC and not from the Babylonian exile, but that would not have been realised in the first century. The relevant part is in chapter 9, In truth, a difficult chapter in a difficult book. The chapter opens with, In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. With this in mind, Daniel prays to God asking for forgiveness for the sins of himself and his people. The angel Gabriel then appears and gives him a typically cryptic message. Seventy sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to restrain transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy one. Know and understand this. From the time that the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in time of trouble. After sixty-two sevens, the anointed one will be put to death, but not for himself. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end, and desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven he will put an end to sacrifice and offering, and one who causes desolation will come upon the wing of the abominable temple until the end of that decree is poured out on the desolated city. So, quite cryptic, 
But put yourself in the position of Jewish scholars writing in the closing years of the first century, trying to make sense of the disaster that had happened and why Yahweh had abandoned them. The relevance to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD is obvious, and there is also clear reference to the central tenet of Christianity, the Anointed One being put to death but not for himself. The relevant dates are not obvious from the various sevens, but taking the chapter as a whole, it appears that our early Jewish scholars concluded that the Anointed One would appear on earth, i.e. be born, 70 years prior to the destruction. This is a common interpretation of the chapter by Christians today, and we know from Tertullian, a 2nd to 3rd century Christian, that early Christians also interpreted it as being about Jesus. Tertullian interpreted sevens to mean seven years, and thereby calculated from the destruction of Solomon's temple forward that this prophecy predicted the destruction of the second temple. His dating scheme did not quite agree with that of our supposed scholars, and he thought that Jesus was born 52 and a half years before the destruction of the second temple. So anyway, our first century Jewish scholars came to the conclusion that they must have missed a trick 70 years before the destruction. In their calendar, the destruction was in the second year of Vespasian. Counting back 70 years, they got to the 28th year of Augustus. The idea developed that the Anointed One was born in the 28th year of Augustus, was put to death, and as a consequence, Jerusalem's destruction followed 70 years after his birth. From these dates, Luke kicks off his Jesus ministry in the 15th year of Tiberius, or 30 AD. And this leads to the involvement of Pilate, Herod, and the high priest Caiaphas, all on record as being in post at that time. This would not be the first retroactive 70-year prophecy in the Bible. There are other 70-year prophecies in the Old Testament. There is the matter of Daniel, which refers to Jeremiah, who had a 70-year prophecy about a town's destruction, as did Isaiah. Now, the date of the destruction of Solomon's temple is known from extra-biblical sources to be 586 BC. The date of completion of the second temple is not known from extra-biblical sources, but is given in the book of Ezra in the Old Testament as the sixth year of the reign of Darius, or 516 BC, another 70-year period. It is likely that the date of completion was written much later and was calculated prophetically rather than from history, in the same way that the date of Jesus' birth may have been calculated from prophecy rather than from history. Incidentally, this 70-year motif also appears in other ancient mythology and probably originates from the Great Day. This is a bit complicated, but if you watch the sunrise at the spring equinox on March 21st on a clear night and note where it rises in relation to the fixed starscape behind it, this position changes slowly and in fact rotates through the entire 360 degrees of the heavens over a period of around 26,000 years, or about 70 years per degree. The cause of this is Earth's axial precession. While the ancients did not understand the reason for this slow drift, they did observe it and they put great symbolic significance on it. So if the date of Jesus' birth was a retrospective prophetic calculation rather than recorded history, it seriously undermines the case for a historical Jesus. If there was a historical Jesus, then the 70-year gap between his birth and the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem was a coincidence. Such a coincidence cannot be excluded by saying that we don't really know the date of Jesus' birth. The relevant date is the date understood by the early church, the same date as used to initiate our current calendar. Therefore, it is the date of the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD that is the coincidence, not our current understanding of the date of Jesus' birth. So, this is quite a strong argument, and within mythicism, it's one of the more credible explanations of how historicist Christianity could have arisen. But is it strong enough to persuade historicists? There are problems. For one thing, Tertullian followed the same basic interpretation of Daniel's prophecy, but he came up with a different time interval, which would be a bit odd if the 70-year time interval was such a central component of the historicization process. But, at least on the face of it, 
Tertullian was calculating forwards from the destruction of Solomon's temple using his interpretation of seven, and therefore came up with a different result from our scholars who were using 70 years to calculate backwards from the destruction of the second temple. And finally, while a 70-year coincidence is certainly suspicious, is it sufficiently improbable to be regarded as proof? I'm sure many people would think not. Nevertheless, I think most would agree that it is suspicious, and as such I consider that the 70-year argument does favour mythicism.